I entered on duty at NACA on June 1, 1942, and retired in January of 1980. The major research areas that I was involved with were military aircraft of World War II, uh, post-war aircraft, uh, spacecraft, and uh, other types of support operations in support of both military and civilian aircraft. The interviewer this morning is uh, Don Byers. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate your uh, <clears throat> coming here and helping out with the program. Uh, let me ask you first, uh, when you got to work at the Langley Lab, I think you already have uh, indicated that, and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your work there. And your earlier background, too, I think is important. Uh, what was your educational background? Well, my educational background was I was uh, attended the University of Wichita in Wichita, Kansas, where I was born and raised, which was the air capital of the world in those days. And then I graduated from the University of Michigan uh, in 1942. Uh, I had applied for uh, a job at the NACA as a junior at school uh, in uh, the winter of 4041, and I received uh, an appointment in October of 1941 uh, to the Langley Laboratory. That, of course, was just a couple of months before Pearl Harbor. And uh, when I came here in June the following year, uh, the Pacific War was beginning to heat up pretty regularly. And uh, many of us had come to work at uh, NACA in the years of 1940, 41, 42, because they were expanding their capabilities. Two new centers had been developed, one at uh, Cleveland, uh, which was the engine facility, and another one out at uh, Navy Base uh, Moffett Field in California another aerodynamic research facility. So I came in on the peak of the new employments. But, you know, that was a real problem because at that time the demands on manpower were getting pretty heavy and the local draft boards were generally in trouble. And they were looking to find some uh, new people and they were looking anxiously uh, at those three centers with all those new employees coming into the area. And that's a, an NACA headquarters people uh, being wise to this problem, called in the senators from those three states and several of the representatives, uh, worked with them, and they set up a special bill that quickly went through Congress on an emergency basis to make a provision for induction of all of their engineers uh, into the military and then assigning them back to their respective bases. Uh, just to make the issue interesting, uh, we had several hundred here at Langley who were all made Class 1A inductees, uh, were all shipped up to Richmond Induction Center and went through the rigmarole there and then were assigned at the end of the day uh, to go back to Langley. Uh, we were put into the Air Corps enlisted reserve in active duty. Now, if you decided to leave, you immediately got called up to active duty and sent to boot camp. Uh, the people up at the Cleveland Center, the engine lab, were inducted into the U.S. Army similarly. But those out at the uh, Moffett Field Center, because they were on an active Navy base, were actually put on active duty uh, in the United States Navy Reserve. But they were assigned there to work at the Moffett Laboratory. Well, that was kind of the picture there that took care of, the, of that problem. And then there were some other problems that began to develop that were interesting because in the Pacific Theater there was a tremendous need for small boat operators. And the Navy didn't have any such people, but the Coast Guard had them. And they were under the Department of Commerce. And by another piece of emergency legislation, an organization called the Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Coast Guard Temporary Reserve was established for providing port security so that regulars could be dismissed and shipped to the theater of operation. So with the thinning of the ranks in our local area here, a local flotilla was organized under civilian control. We were then taken into the Coast Guard Temporary Reserve. Some were assigned to port security shore duty. Some of us were assigned to boat duty uh, in the harbor to provide harbor patrol. Uh, I did my duty one day a week, 12 hours and a, and a night, on a 38-foot picket boat for several years until the end of the war. But that was just another additional military support that was provided by a good many members of not only NACA, but also the shipyards and, and other uh, organizations in the local area in the defense industry. Hmm. Let me ask you, you, you were assigned when you came on duty uh, with NASA or NACA, uh, wh who was you? Who were you assigned to work with? I was assigned under Abe Silverstein in the full-scale wind tunnel, and uh, in that wind tunnel, uh, we could actually test full-sized airplanes, in at least the pursuit type or fighter type aircraft of those days. Also, torpedo bombers and uh, dive bombers could be tested, both engine on and engine off. And 
One of the big problems, and especially showing up in the Pacific Theater, but also in the European Theater, was the high-speed performance of our aircraft, which were often deficient. And so one of the first jobs we did when an airplane would come in, and by the way, they would fly these airplanes into Langley Field. They'd put them up, uh, hook them up to a tractor and tow them over to the wind tunnel on the streets, uh, roll them in through the side doors right into the test section, and then we'd spend about the next 12 to 24 hours uh, doing a job that was kind of dirty because what we did was to seal up, close up every opening, every gap, every step, every leak possibility on the airplane, take the prop off of it, and of course mechanics came over to do some of those tasks for us. And once we got the airplane all sealed up and smoothed down, and by the way, we used all kinds of tape, anywhere we could get tape from. Uh, Red Cross supplied us tape, they bought tape by the, by the pound. Uh, we also used a material that we called uh, a mud, which was basically children's play uh, clay, a plastiline, and we'd mix a little extra uh, petroleum jelly with that to make it work a little easier, and we'd use that to smooth up all those cracks and surfaces to get a minimum drag point on the airplane. Now in the meantime, the machine shop right next door would be making some special parts so that we could mount the airplane on the struts on top of the balance house uh, to be able to test it in the wind tunnel. And the, the situation was kind of interesting because we used ordinary Toledo scales to measure forces, uh, but they had punch tape, or uh, rather printed tape outputs. So when a test point was to be made, each scale printed its own test point. Uh, as we changed angle of attack or changed uh, speed and the test conditions in the wind tunnel were also recorded. Well, once we'd get that basic test run all the way from negative angles of attack up to the stall, uh, then we'd start to uncover the airplane, so to speak, get it into flying capability. Minimum uncover. We'd pull a piece of aluminum that we'd covered up the engine uh, openings with and the oil cooler openings and uh, the flaps and the cow flaps and uh, the ailerons and control services, and then we'd get the best low drag flying condition. And that was another major test point. And then after that we'd uh, begin to uncover such things as steps and other uh, covers and openings where there might be leaks and drag. And what we were looking for was how can you reduce the drag of the airplane out in the field and get that speed up. Some airplanes we were able to increase by oh, 10, 12, 15 knots. Other airplanes all the way up to about 50 knots in forward speed uh, down on the deck. And you see, it was this kind of thing on, well, airplanes like uh, P-47s, uh, P-51s, uh, P-63s, uh, the P-59 was uh, also one of those airplanes that we worked with in those days. Uh, we had a P-77, which was an old plywood airplane, never got into production, it was too late in the war. Uh, Navy airplanes like the SB-2C, the, the uh, SBD, and and those kind of airplanes all underwent that kind of uh, drag uh, performance uh, uh, checking and testing. And it was the SBD, of course, that uh, outperformed uh, so superiorly for us at the Battle of Midway that enabled that uh, disaster for the Japanese to take place. Then there were other problems that cropped up. Uh, we had engine cooling problems with the first B-24s that went over to the African desert. And I got assigned to one of the tasks uh, on a Friday morning after about the first flight of those had uh, gone out and not a, I think only one airplane made it back to the field that day uh, with all engines operating. Uh, the rest, uh, a couple of them got back with three. Uh, a couple managed to power glide in with two engines and we lost a couple of airplanes uh, that day in the sands and on the beaches. Uh, but uh, Dr. Reed, who was our engineer in charge uh, with the uh, Air Corps people called Abe Silverstein and several of us into his office, told us the problem on a Friday. And he agreed that we would solve the problem as quickly as possible. Well, I got assigned the task of building a complete nacelle and cowlings for one of those double row engines. Uh, somebody else got the task of building a, a old concrete platform out behind the wind tunnel and steel structure to mount the engine on. Somebody else got the task of getting all the instrumentation together and the engine arrived on Tuesday morning, got mounted, and we had it actually running Wednesday, uh, Tuesday night, taking first data Wednesday morning. We found the problem. Uh, hot cylinders, hot uh, spots on the back row of cylinders, 
uh, sheet metal people cut some new pieces for baffles to redirect the flow that we had observed with tufts on the cylinders, literally. And redirecting the flow cooled the cylinders, problem solved, and they shipped the pieces out from East Hartford over to Africa uh, just a few days later. You said tufts on the cylinders, the tufts of what was that? Oh, we used wool, uh, uh, knitting wool, uh, that we just stuck on with tape. And those were to visualize the airflow. Yeah. And that allowed us to know how to put the baffles and how to get the air to where it needed to cool the, the engine properly. That was one of those interesting things. But a, a major thing in the full-scale tunnel uh, was drag and stability and control, uh, both power on and power off. And we actually ran a number of the uh, aircraft in power on operation to get that data as well by simply putting a mechanic up in the airplane. And we did it two different ways. One, we had uh, we would use the fuel tanks in the airplane if we weren't concerned about the real weight of the airplane. If we were concerned about knowing the weight accurately and the fuel consumption, then we had tanks that were down on uh, uh, scales down below in the balance house, and we called them weigh tanks that we could monitor the fuel consumption continuously and get a, a even more accurate data that way. So those were some of the things we did. But after the war then uh, was over, uh, when the, the surrender occurred, we began to move towards more uh, basic research. And I had been involved in boundary layers and boundary layer control for some time and got involved with air inlets because jet engines were beginning to come into the picture. And they were gobblers of huge quantities of air. And we had no basic data uh, for taking air in on the side of a fuselage or in an underslung scoop. We had lots of data on cowlings that had been generated over the years, both low speed and high speed data, but no data at all was available on air scoops and inlets. So I got involved in that at low speed doing basic research work uh, in the full scale tunnel. And that led to a, another assignment a little bit later. Uh, let me ask you, did you have any information out of uh, Germany or other, uh, they seem to be more advanced in some areas than we were, again, on the intakes for the jet engines, or was that also kind of a, uh, low knowledge area. That was a black art area for just about everyone. Uh, they didn't have any more information, I don't think, than we did at the time. And later, uh, information as we acquired after the war was over pretty well proved that. So we weren't behind the, we weren't behind the eight ball, you might say, uh, in that activity. It was just the fact that there had not been the need for it until that time came around. But for engines using nose inlets, we had plenty of data. It was those side inlets. Now, the uh, Ames Laboratory developed a special, uh, what we called a, a flush side inlet that kept the boundary layer out of the inlet, but that was basically a point design, and it didn't work very well over a broad range of operating conditions. So my task was really involved in trying to develop some basic data that could be useful over a broad range of operating conditions. And what, what time period was this roughly? This was the beginning? Well, this was after the surrender in, in the late 1940s. And then I was asked to continue that work over into the eight-foot high-speed tunnel in the late 1940s. And that resulted actually in another kind of a side issue, a development of new model technology. Because the kind of models I needed were to be able to measure forces on force balances with strain gauges, simultaneously take pressure distributions, make flow measurements in ducts. And we had main ducts that we had to do it in. We had to control the flow. We had boundary layer ducts that we had to measure and control the flow. And we need to measure pressures on the surfaces. Uh, metal models were not satisfactory. Fiberglass technology was just beginning to come along. And we began to investigate that. And our shops, our model shops, built the first major high-speed wind tunnel models from fiberglass for that particular job. And that was the beginning of all fiberglass and resin models uh, for doing wind tunnel research at high speeds. And benefited greatly all of the wind tunnel research because it was easier to build, uh, simpler to, to modify, and so forth. But those models were basically just axis symmetric bodies, an after body with all the instrumentation in it, and a forebody that could be interchanged so we could change different types of inlets and get it. So we ran through a number of different configurations and got a lot of basic data that was used at high speeds for a good many years thereafter. And nearly all of the post-war aircraft uh, made use of that data in their inlet designs for the jet engine operations, uh, single engine as well as multi-engine installations. 
uh, you talked about axisymmetric or something like that. What does that mean? I, I mean a circular body, like a, like a long sausage. Uh, full, full, both sides, both halves, or was it just one one half of the aircraft? No, this was not an aircraft. This was okay. just like the whole fuselage. Okay. Just just a fuselage, but a circular fuselage. And what what the sort of aircraft? Once you got to work on these uh, inlets and uh, uh, jet engine intakes, uh, what what aircraft were they applied on? Well, actually, at the same time, there were some other things going on that I probably should mention that affected uh, the post-war effort particularly because we were getting into the transonic problems and we wanted to fly transonically and supersonically and there were contracts out to build airplanes to fly supersonically, only nobody knew how to do it. We just knew there was a huge drag rise at transonic speeds caused by shock waves. Now, in wind tunnel testing, uh, and this is an important point, in wind tunnel testing, once you got a shock wave on a model and as you moved the, the speed up a little bit, that shock wave intersected the walls of the tunnel and the tunnel did what we call choke and you couldn't go any faster. Well, in order to get around that problem, we did something also rather strange. We built kind of a nozzle out of plaster and we'd move the model back into the nozzle and test at about 1.2 Mach number. So we could test up to drag rise when the first shock waves and then we would skip that area and go to 1.2 and get data there, but we couldn't get any data in between. And along about the same time, one of our physicist engineers, a guy by the name of Ray Wright, working under John Stack as a team, uh, began to experiment with how to relieve the shock wave in the test section so that we could test through that area, and that resulted in the slotted wind tunnel concept, which was very quickly incorporated into the old eight-foot high-speed tunnel. And Dick Whitcomb came along about this time with his first drag studies with, again, just circular bodies, studying the transonic behavior. And uh, he began to build circular bodies that were equivalent area distributions longitudinally to an airplane. Now, let me illustrate. If I take an ordinary airplane and slice it through at various stations and calculate the whole area of the wing and the fuselage at that particular station, then he would convert that to a circular body shape. And so he had a bulgy circular body that simulated the flow around a total airplane uh, in, in a sense. Well, this enabled him to physically understand what was going on at transonic speeds and how to relieve or reduce the intensity of those shock waves. And I was privileged to be on that team and work with him on that work and, and saw that begin to develop. And then suddenly we had a new wind tunnel facility called the, the eight-foot transonic pressure tunnel, which was the first major uh, high Reynolds number capability facility for transonic testing. And, uh, and just associated with that, in order to control the flow in and out of those slots, we had some huge compressors that, I think we had two 100,000 cubic foot compressors, cubic foot per minute compressors, to handle that airflow uh, and to control the flow. But this allowed continuous testing all the way from the very lowest speeds right up to about 1.3 Mach number. So even with the slots in the tunnel, you could maintain a pressure above atmospheric. Oh yes, uh-huh. Yeah. And, and Dick Whitcomb began, and his team began to work in that wind tunnel uh, now with three-dimensional models after having understood some of the flow properties with, with just axial, symmetric, or circular bodies, uh, began to work with wings. And of course, uh, wing sweepback was one of those things that helped to relieve the problem. But then he learned that shaping the body itself could relieve the problem. And so we came to the Marilyn Monroe shape or the Coke bottle shape or whatever you want to call it. And the F-102 airplane built by Convair was the first airplane that was intended to fly supersonically, and it wouldn't in its original form, but it did uh, when he got through with it. Many, many hours were spent in that wind tunnel with him on the end of a rasp and a file, shaping and reshaping the surface of that fuselage and the wing fuselage juncture region, which was critical to shockwave formation, in order to get rid or reduce the intensity of those shockwaves. And uh, so many hours were spent by him and many of uh, the rest of us doing the same sort of thing under his supervision for that particular airplane. A short time later, the Grumman people were contracted to build the first from scratch transonic airplane. And that was known as the F-11F. That was also pretty well finished in design in the eight foot tunnel and by that, hand. That F-111F was that? No, F-11F. F-11, I'm sorry, F-11. I think it was F-11. Uh, 
that F-11F, that was a Korean War airplane, is that right? Uh, that one really never saw service because it was superseded by another airplane uh, a very short time later. Uh, they, but that was a very important development because that was the first airplane really designed from scratch to fly supersonically. And after that, we came with the F-8U series of airplanes, the F-8U-3, which was the, I guess it was the biggest and heaviest and most formidable naval aircraft, a single engine that was ever designed and built. That was a very successful venture uh, and had capabilities of uh, close to 1.8 or something like that. But the Navy made a decision. We don't want single engine airplanes on our carriers. We want twin engines. And so we went to McDonnell then with their development program and of course that whole F-4 fighter program which saw great uh, service during uh, the Korean uh, operation. Uh, and the F-4 was the, the Vietnam? It was, that was basically Vietnam, yeah, okay. the time frame. And it was twin engined. Now the first versions of that, they had flame out problems with that because they didn't know how to design the inlet properly. And that's where some of that old data came into being again and designing the boundary layer control uh, inlet diverter system. So, you know, that old data showed up in many different kinds of ways. Uh, Dick's data with the supercritical uh, airfoil type concepts began to go into computational aerodynamics then. Computers, you know, were coming along and we began to be able to compute two-dimensional airfoils fairly well uh, in those day and time. When you say two-dimensional airfoils, what, what is that? That's a section of a wing, small, cut a small piece out of a wing, that's almost a two-dimensional airfoil. Three dimensions were still very troublesome and still are today, as far as that goes, largely because of the viscous effects of air, which we call boundary layer. And uh, there's, there's still a problem. But uh, after the F-4, then we got into the swing wing concept uh, of the F-111. And we worked heavily with the Air Force on that from Langley, and I was part of that team as well. So I was involved with a lot of those military aircraft in that day and time and in working with those uh, supercritical airfoils and Dick went on and did his winglet rework to reduce the induced drag of airplanes at cruise conditions and today we see aircraft with winglets on them uh, operational even. Uh, let, let me back up a minute uh, to the swept wing. Uh, can you tell us what that, um, what that does uh, to uh, make a flight, flight faster basically? Well, basically, the swept wing actually allows the airflow to go supersonically a section at a time, you might say, so that it's distributed over a very long longitudinal area. You don't have the buildup and pile up of a very big, heavy shock wave, which is the real drag producer. But you get a whole series of small shock waves along the wing, and that helps the, the flow over the wing and helps the whole total flow of the picture and the drag. Well, swept wing became very important. Uh, uh, that was actually uh, came out of some theory that was very antique theory, goes back to the 30s, but was practically did not become available until the mid 40s. Uh, you, you, you had mentioned something about uh, Dick Whitcomb and Marilyn Monroe. Now that sounds intriguing. What's the story there? Well, you see, in shaping the fuselage in order to reduce the shockwave intensity at the wing fuselage juncture area, it became indented, and uh, some people referred to it as the Coke bottle shape, if you remember the old Coke bottles. Uh, somebody else attached to it, the Marilyn Monroe shape, for her physical body contours as being uh, wasp waist, I guess is the word to use. That's how that terminology came into being. Well, from there, uh, the F-4, you're, you're into the Vietnam War, of course, at that time, and uh, after that, what was your what was your area of research? Well, I got involved in several different things along about that time. I was involved with uh, some of the X-15 work. And uh, at the time of the X-15 uh, activity that I was involved with, I was also getting involved in some of the space activities in uh, terms of uh, thinking what could we do in some time later time frame about recovery and reusing some of the vehicles that we were talking about. And so I was doing some basic work in a configurational work in both horizontal and vertical takeoff launch type vehicles that could be reused. And the X-15 program was moving along and they were trying to exploit its total capabilities to maximum altitude and speed range, but in order to do that they had to add extra fuel to the airplane. 
And they decided to do this with an external tank. Well, in some of my work, I had already taken a look at some preliminary uh, studies of staging of parallel staged vehicles. And so I had some hardware already available that we could modify. And so we had a model that was not too far from kind of what looked like an X-15 model that we could use as a basic research tool. And then we could just build some simple cylindrical models that would be tanks. And we could attach the tank to a separate balance system that we could then articulate in relative angle and spacing from the main body of the vehicle and get actual staging separation conditions uh, for the tank as well as the airplane. Because we needed to new, know what happened to the stability of the aircraft during that maneuver. And uh, the people at North American uh, were especially uh, receptive to that kind of data because they had none. Uh, there was none available. And it was kind of interesting, after we supplied them with the data and they applied it uh, to their planning for the, doing the stage separation, that I got a phone call one day that the X-15 had made its first tank drop separation and that everything went just as expected. And that was very satisfying to know that we'd contributed something to that project in that very real fashion. Well, let me ask you, uh, of course, the tank separation for the X-15 was probably a relatively high altitude, is that right? Yes, and it was at about transonic speed, so we had the capability of simulating that pretty well in the 8-foot transonic pressure tunnel. And uh, how does that, al that kind of altitude uh, affect the shockwave formation? Well, it affects it very seriously, but of course at altitude it's not as strong nor as powerful as it would be at lower altitude. Uh, so they would want to do the separation at about as high an altitude as they could and probably as high as Mach number as they dared go. Uh, and transonic speed seemed to be a pretty good place to do it because the interference between the tank and the main aircraft were going to produce some very severe shock waves. So they wanted to dump it, <laughs> get rid of it, and then propel on up. That's the way they worked that particular problem. But you know, the, the other interesting aspect of that particular time frame was that we had these two huge compressors in the eight-foot tunnel, and we decided to, we could use those to build a little pilot tunnel for some supersonic and hypersonic testing up on another floor of the building. And so we had a little wind tunnel that would go from Mach 3 to Mach 6. And I carried some of the work of the uh, uh, reusable launch vehicles up to those speed ranges with some models. And then we got the idea that says, well, wait a minute, we've got this Apollo program coming on, the Saturn V vehicle. And by the way, I'd been working with the Marshall people on some of this stuff, supplying with a, lots of aerodynamic data for some of their future project studies under Dr. Von Braun. And this, this was for uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles? Well, not at this particular point in time. This was largely for reusable launch systems. I was also involved in some of that uh, work with uh, Bernie Schriever out at El Segundo, California. But it was largely related not just to intercontinental ballistic missiles, but rather to the idea of recovering objects from space and repairing them uh, that I got involved. And that was another aspect of launch vehicles and spacecraft uh, that I was involved with. So Bernie Schriever was a very important individual in pursuing the ballistic missile work. But we were not at NASA Langley heavily involved in that. But the exhaust plume work was applicable to some of that. But more importantly for, Na uh, for NASA at that time, and by the way, let me make a comment. I wear on my lapel two very interesting pins. The bottom one is a 15-year NACA service pin that only a few of us can still wear. And the upper one is a 35-year uh, NASA service pin for my total service of more than 38 years at NASA. So I'm, I'm very proud of those. But it was during this particular time uh, in the late 1950s and mid-60s that I was involved with uh, a lot of this uh, space stuff and uh, with Bernie Schriever out there. And we were concerned about the exhaust plume effects at stage separation. And with the Apollo program coming along with a manned moon flight, we had to have some pretty good knowledge of what was going on. So in this little Mach 6 tunnel, we could simulate staging of the first and second stage uh, of, the, of the Saturn V vehicle pretty close to altitude conditions and speed conditions. So we piped nitrogen up there and generated a little rocket exhaust system and began to get optical and pressure measurements in that region and made an interesting discovery that the 
airflow around the vehicle was going to be heavily disturbed by that second stage rocket engine as it fired up and would probably result in loss of radio signals from that vehicle for a considerably longer time than they'd anticipated. And the result of that was that when they made the first or second, I think it was the first A flight, which was an unmanned flight of a Saturn V vehicle, about a week before we supplied data to them and they changed the, the programming to allow about eight seconds of signal loss instead of the four seconds they were originally predicting. So we had a little impact on that too and that was kind of uh, an interesting aspect or a side issue. But it was important data that we went on and gathered quite a lot of information on and published results on that everybody used, including some of the ballistic missile people, I'm sure. So when you fired, fired a, uh, uh, a rocket, that affected the airflow over, as you said, over the entire missile. The entire vehicle, yeah. What a vehicle. Uh, can, you just, can you talk just a little bit about how that affects the flow? Okay. Uh, the exhaust plume acts almost like adding a solid body to the back end of the vehicle in terms of the oncoming airflow. And of course, we're at supersonic speeds. And therefore, that feeds forward through the boundary layer and through the viscous effects on the body to all the way up to the front of the vehicle, or nearly so, and affects the way the shock wave behaves and the flow separation on the vehicle. All of that impacts the uh, radio signals coming from the vehicle or being received by the vehicle from outside sources. And it was that problem that uh, we were able to supply some useful information to. But it, it doesn't uh, create any instability, apparently. In, the, in other words, traject trajectory is not affected. Basically. The trajectory is not basically affected by it. Uh, it is an unsteady motion, but it is so random and so rapid in motion that it doesn't basically affect trajectory at all. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, airfoil research and uh, computer computer generated uh, studies in the wind tunnel. Okay, let me back or, or up. So, so, I'm sorry, some are wind tunnel and some are computer, I guess. Yeah. Well, let me back up just a second there to, to Dick Whitcomb's supercritical oh. wing work because computational aerodynamics was moving along very rapidly. And we were beginning to be able to compute the shapes of ideal supercritical airfoils. And at that particular point in time, I launched off by direction to revive an old wind tunnel that had been used years before and convert it to new airfoil technology studies, which we did for several years by rebuilding the old low turbulence pressure tunnel into a two-dimensional test facility. And in that facility, we utilized computational aerodynamics extensively uh, through contracts and university grants to design new airfoils that we then tested in that wind tunnel for general aviation, for, uh, uh, for uh, transport aircraft, for military aircraft, for rotorcraft, for many different kinds of, of uh, uh, applications. And all of that kind of consummated about 1978 in a major uh, uh, convention or conference on advanced uh, airfoil technology that was uh, occupied three days at Langley and was, uh, had about 50 papers given by people from all over the world including NASA industry universities, as well as other countries. And I think we had about 15 countries represented in that conference. After that, I moved, I moved over to some other tasks to help revitalize some other wind tunnels. Um, the, uh, the use of computers now, the, the, there's a popular impression that you can just, uh, uh, you don't need the wind tunnels. You just put it all on the computer. The computer's got the program, and so you want to design a new airfoil, punch in the numbers, and out it comes. Uh, whatever happened to the wind tunnel in that process? Well, the process is not quite that simple. Uh, you have what we call real flow effects, namely the effect of air viscosity, uh, which is involved and which affects flow. And it's not an easy thing to compute in two dimensions because of all of the boundary layer data that's available, and even then was pretty well available. You could do a good approximation in a design but you nearly always had to verify it through wind tunnel tests uh, to make sure that everything was right. We improved our capabilities tremendously over the years. We even reached a point where we could design a wing fairly well in three dimensions. But unfortunately, because you have wing body effects and other uh, interfering effects, 
the computational world just can't deal with that complex a problem in its totality, but it can go a long ways toward designing a complete airplane today, taking into account in a nominal sense uh, the boundary layer and viscous effects. But uh, in most cases, you still need to get some kind of basic wind tunnel data uh, to, to get the baseline point. Okay? And uh, I, I'm interested in this uh, supercritical wing. Uh, again, a Whitcomb development, is oh, yeah. that right? And it puzzles me how, how you can develop lift with a flat surface on the top and a curved surface on the bottom, basically. And, uh, can you explain how that works? Well, very simple. Actually, it's a fairly simple concept. Now, the flat surface on the top and the shape of the leading edge uh, results in the acceleration around the, the nose section of the airfoil in a, such a fashion that you distribute the load over the whole top of the airfoil rather than near the leading edge as the older airfoils primarily did. Now, most of the lift, about 90 to 95 percent of the lift, comes from what we call the suction on the upper surface. Now, the suction is created by the uh, super speed, if you want to think of it that way, over the overspeed of the flow over the top of the airfoil. Now, if it's all concentrated at the leading edge, then you get these strong shock waves and you get strong suction peaks up near the leading edge. If you shape it just right, you can spread that distribution of low pressure over the airfoil on the top surface. Now, the bottom surface is only going to see a positive pressure and it can only be what we call 1Q pressure whereas the upper pressures can be negative 3, 4, 5, 6 Q, uh, which is the dynamic pressure. But we don't want big numbers because that means high speeds. So you reduce the level of the overspeed on the top, but distribute over a larger area and get the lift. Okay, in other words, you're saying that you never generate on the bottom surface of that wing uh, anything near the suction, let's say, that you no. do on the uh, top of the wing. Most of the bottom of the wing is actually at slower speeds than the airstream, except right around the leading edge or some little localized spots where it'll be a little bit higher. But generally speaking, the bottom of the wing is at slower speeds and therefore slightly higher pressures uh, than would be in the, in the airstream, but it contributes only a small amount to the lift. Uh, how about military aircraft airfoils, uh, those used today probably? Uh, how do they differ from airfoils 30, 40 years ago? Well, let's say if we go 30 or 40 years ago, we're back into the old NACA type series airfoils. And most aircraft today have specialized airfoils that are designed for the particular uh, type of airplane in use. Uh, depending on what its uh, ultimate speed range is, if you go to uh, the high supersonic speed aircraft, there'll be more pointed noses, uh, leading edges. Uh, thinner leading edges than would be for slower speed aircraft. But every one of them today can be pretty well designed uh, on a computer to have the kind of load distribution uh, and shockwave distributions that you want. And you can get pretty close to them. Uh, the wind tunnel that we have out at Langley today, the National Transonic Facility, was a very important new facility a few years ago. In fact, about the time of my retirement. In fact, that was what caused my retirement when I did was because I was going to have to go through that, that startup period of about four years to get that facility operational. And I had the good fortune of being able to name a young man to take, a, take over that job. And he did a fine job with it. His name was Larry Edwards. But anyway, uh, that facility is still needed uh, very much so to prove out the design concepts. Uh, once you do the computational aerodynamics, you've got to get to the real world. Mm -hmm. And you can't quite make it with computational aerodynamics yet. Maybe someday we will, but we cannot actually foresee the total abandonment of uh, wind tunnel research. Yeah. You might clear up something in my mind. Back in the 50s, more or less, the F-102 and 106, the Delta wings, uh, those, are, those were useful at that period, but they're apparently not any longer. Uh, what, what's good and bad about a delta wing structure compared with what we're doing now? Oh, the delta wing structure as a structure was a very fine structure. It just didn't provide us with the maneuvering capabilities that we wanted to have. Uh, they tend to be rather slow in maneuver uh, and uh, that becomes very important of course for fighter aircraft. And so the, the swept wing concept and the variable sweep concept uh, allows you to have that maneuverability.
uh, at the different conditions and then also to have the lower landing speed conditions that you'd like to have. So the, uh, at, at the time that the Delta Wing was uh, uh, in use uh, by the military services, the mission was a little different, wasn't it? In other words, it was to intercept the Russian bombers that were... It was basically an intercept mission, intercept. yeah. Not a fighter type mission at all, uh, nor did it have a, a great huge maneuvering requirement. Yeah. We were trying to get those big bear bombers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what period was that? The, uh, Ooh. Again, the Cold War. That would be the Cold War period of the uh, 50s. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned rotary wing airfoils. That's interesting. Uh, talk a little bit about the design of rotary wing airfoils. Well, interestingly, because uh, rotary wing aircraft have many of the same kinds of problems that ordinary fixed wing aircraft have in terms of their wings uh, because of the acceleration uh, of the flow over the airfoil, uh, the rotary wing aircraft airfoil behaves more like a two-dimensional airfoil than a, like a swept wing on an airplane. So two-dimensional testing was very appropriate for that. And in order to improve uh, many of the problems that rotary wing aircraft naturally suffered from at these high rotational speeds, particularly out near the tips, the supercritical wing concept became very useful on the inboard sections where the flow has never reached those kind of speeds, then the low speed general aviation type airfoils uh, became very useful. And so we were working with both types of airfoils for rotary wing type aircraft. But in reducing the shockwave formation on the airfoil, you're doing lots of things. First of all, you're relieving some of the structural loads uh, on the airfoil itself, on the structure of the, of the uh, blade, but you're also helping to reduce the noise problem. And uh, that's a, a critical problem with all rotary type, wing type aircraft. Yes, obviously uh, some of the aircraft are a little bit better at that. Uh, why is, what, what creates that noise, the helicopter noise? Well, the, the blade motion itself, uh, sometimes referred to as blade slap, uh, as it rotates around from an up going, from a forward facing, forward traveling blade to a rear traveling blade, they have to change the angle of attack very drastically. And uh, that often results in what's called blade slap. And the noise is generated as a result of that sudden change. Uh, in angle of attack in, in the airstream. It sees a terrible airflow, just to make a point. <laughs> uh, many of the helicopter rotor blades ha are sy symmetrical. Uh, the, the Huey, for example, the HU and the series uh, down, down in the Space Center, sure. I noticed it's got a symmetrical airfoil. Uh, why is that? And you could develop more lift, I would assume, with a, with a uh, different kind Cam of airfoil. Cambered airfoil? Yeah. Well, of course you can, but because of the complex flow behavior that you have to deal with in the hel helicopter, which is both forward and rearward motion, fl motion flow, it turns out that indeed uh, a nearly symmetrical airfoil, it comes close to being ideal to be able to handle that problem because you have portions of that airfoil that are actually seeing negative speeds. See, the trailing edge becomes the leading edge uh, on, on the down going blade, you might say. And that creates an additional problem there. But the supercritical design type that distributed the load over the airfoil uh, became a very useful tool even for those kinds of airfoils. And I think you were saying that you do get the formation of shock waves toward the tip end of the uh, rotor. Oh, yes. Is that right? Yeah. Sure. Because yeah, you're going, going, actually going supersonic or just underneath, under? Well, some of the modern ones go supersonic out there. The earlier ones, they had to stay away from it because that resulted in too much twisting motion uh, due to the moments that were generated in, in the blade. Yeah. And uh, could literally twist a blade in half. <laughs> well, let's see how we're, well, we're doing pretty well here. Uh, Oh, let me give you, John Becker wrote this, and it's very interesting. Um, until 52 or 53, there was no realization. We were on the verge of the space age. And then suddenly, hypersonic speeds became possible into space, an exciting period. You were there, of course, at that time. Sure. And uh, what was your sensation, and what was your feeling about that? Well, our feeling was that we were working always on the kind of the fringes of knowledge in our our desire was to expand our knowledge into those fringe areas. Uh, 
and all of our activities at the uh, NACA, I think, uh, and, and getting into NASA in 57, all of our activities were geared at expanding our, our basic, uh, you might say, uh, framework of knowledge. And so we were pushing the speed envelopes, uh, we were pushing the, can, the structural envelopes in our structures organizations. Instrumentation had to be improved uh, all the way across the board. Uh, computational capabilities had to be improved. And so, yes, we were right in that era where we were pushing every boundary there was. And it was a very interesting as well as an exciting era to be a part of. And as soon as it became obvious that we were going into space, that opened up a whole new vista for, for NASA to be involved with, uh, both in the aerodynamic world as well as in the ballistic type world. And this was well before the, the major announcement and the push in our space program. Is that right? NASA Langley had been working on this for quite a while. Uh, yes, indeed. Actually, uh, the, the early part of those programs uh, were involved not with space per se, but with simply high-speed aerodynamics. Uh, we were pushing the high-speed aerodynamics to, to its limits. Uh, we also became involved, of course, along with the X-15 program and with the Air Force, uh, we became involved with the lifting body work as soon as the space activities began to come along, and we had the HL-10 kind of design, which uh, I think they called X-24 or something like that. And uh, we had a very interesting little exercise as a result of that program uh, at Langley. There was a, a model of uh, the X-24 in one of its versions called the SV-5, and there was a D version of that that actually flew in space and was recovered after flying uh, in a lifting reentry uh, pattern uh, on, on a reentry. And we were able to get one of the vehicles that actually reentered uh, to one of the Langley research tunnels and obtain data on what the aerodynamic characteristics were of a charred surface on a reentry vehicle. Uh, nobody knew what those aerodynamic characteristics were, uh, but that body was uh, relatively small in size. Uh, my recollection was that it was not more than eight or 10 feet long, something like that. And we put that into our transonic dynamics tunnel to actually tra test from subsonic to transonic speeds uh, with that ablated surface of a real vehicle that had never, so far as we knew at that time, been touched by human hands. Mm -hmm. Everybody wore gloves in handling the vehicle, and uh, we were able to get our hands on that. And this was a precursor, of course, to the shuttle. Oh, sure. The reentry, because you're talking about lifting body. That is basically what the shuttle is, isn't it? That's right. On reentry. Uh, where, 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 how and where was that launch? This, uh, uh, that was a Vandenberg launch, and the reentry occurred over the western states, I think Oregon, Idaho, and that area. Uh, it was a parachute type recovery, ultimately. And the first, they built four of the vehicles, expecting to do four launches. Uh, the first vehicle flew about 1,200 miles aerodynamically during reentry in what we call cross-range flight during the reentry mode. The second vehicle, I think, flew about 1,500 miles and the program was so successful, they canceled the flight program. So they left the two remaining vehicles untouched. But that was, a, that was the first successful lifting reentry vehicle. And they come in at a pretty good angle of attack, don't they? Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> I don't remember what the angle of attack was, but it was probably up somewhere around 60, 70 degrees angle of attack. Yeah. Well, uh, finally, uh, how would you summarize your career at NACA slash NASA? Well, I suppose my near 40-year career could be uh, emphasized as uh, the work with the uh, fighter and bomber type aircraft of World War II in the full-scale tunnel where we expanded our technical knowledge and base there uh, by doing drag work and then to help solve some of the most challenging problems in that post-war era that faced all of the military aircraft and getting up the speed into the transonic speed range. And I suppose I could say that uh, I had the privilege of working with some of the world's most advanced scientific thinkers of that era as we worked through into the space age even. And uh, uh, let me ask you if there's any one contribution that you worked on uh, during that period of, uh, of uh, your ex experience. Uh, what 
What do you think that might be that made the greatest contribution to the advancement of aviation and or space? That's a tough one to deal with because we're dealing with a whole series of technology periods. Uh, I could pick one out of each of those periods, but to pick one out of the whole uh, gamut is a very difficult thing. Okay, yeah, pick some of the major if you can. Well, of course, drag in World War II performance. Okay. Uh, Post-war military aircraft performance, supercritical supersonic drag, uh, inlet technology, right along in there all going to go hand in hand. And uh, wing research uh, that affected all of uh, transport aircraft, military aircraft, civilian aircraft in the later years was certainly a useful uh, contribution to make. And I wouldn't neglect some of our work in space activities. Uh, the exhaust plume work was kind of interesting. Uh, made an interesting little uh, sidelight, I should say, but it was a tidbit that was important. Yep. Anything you'd like to add to uh, any uh Humorous experiences, any uh, startling experiences? Uh, oh, tell us a little bit about when you redesigned that tunnel, rebuilt that tunnel to uh, become a pressure tunnel, and it, apparently some people were concerned about that. Well, that was an interesting pass because the low turbulence pressure tunnel was designed to operate at up to about 60 pounds of pressure, and they, the technicians had to work in that pressure and therefore had to be depressurized every time they came and went. Uh, in recertifying that tunnel for airfoil research, I wanted to make it so that the technicians did not have to work under pressure. So we built actual doors that sealed off the main tank from the test section so that then you could work at atmospheric pressure right in the test section. We built uh, special mounts to test two-dimensional airfoils that spanned the entire test section. And we could bring the, the pressure leads and all the other force leads out the side of the wind tunnel on the outside instead of having to handle them inside. But then we also had to recertify the tank because it hadn't been used for so many years uh, for the operational pressure that we wanted to operate to get high Reynolds numbers uh, on those airfoil test sections. And that turned out to be a very interesting task because nobody had ever done it before. And that became one of the tasks that I had to do. And, and one of the interesting little tidbits on that was that the uh, director for aeronautics came over to my office one day, which was located about 20 feet from the wall of that tank, I guess. Uh, and he sat down, uh, that was Larry Lofton. And uh, he looked at me and he said, Ken, he said, how's the recertification coming? I said, we're doing just fine. We're making progress. We're going to get the job done. It'll be done right. And it'll be totally safe. And he looked at me with a kind of a grin in his face and a John, and, a, and a little twinkle in his eye, and he said, well, Ken, you're awful close to Tactical Headquarters Command a building right over here, because that was just about 100 yards away. I said, yeah, if this tank ever blows, it'll wipe them all out over there. And he made this comment to me. He said, Ken, he said, if I ever find you move your office back to Eight Foot Tunnel, he said, I'm going to shut this place down for good, real quick. <laughs> yeah, we had lots of interesting things that happened along the way. But that was a successful operation, and it was in use several years. Uh, well, we're getting close. Anything more you'd like to add? Dude? I don't know that there's really anything uh, of special interest other than to say that uh, I not only had an interesting uh, career, it was both self-satisfying and hopefully uh, we were able to provide some useful inputs to our national defense interests along the way.